Don't forget, you can reach the latest episode of Potomac Watch anytime. Just ask your smart speaker, play the opinion Potomac Watch podcast. That is, play the opinion Potomac Watch podcast. From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome back. I'm Paul Gigo with Kim Strassel and Kate O'Dell. And we're talking about Russia's influence in American politics and how it might play out in the campaign. Kim, tell us about this odd story that an FBI informant, longtime FBI informant, was indicted by the special counsel David Weiss last week for, I guess, lying to the FBI about what he was telling them about Hunter Biden spreading disinformation, allegedly, about uh, Hunter Biden. This is the FBI informant who had sometimes been mentioned by Republicans for those allegations about Hunter. What's the background here? So the background here is that years ago, this informant, who considered a confidential human source, we now know he's a dual citizen, by the way, of Israel and the U.S. We don't know a great deal about him beyond that, though. But this confidential human informant told the FBI years ago that he had information taken from sources within Ukraine. In particular, he was making references to the head of Burisma, the Ukrainian energy firm, claiming that there was some deal in which Burisma or people connected to it had agreed to pay Joe Biden and Hunter Biden $5 million apiece. And this was meant to be, or we were thought to have been in return for Joe Biden intervening to get Ukrainian prosecutors off Burisma's back. Now, of course, This all goes back to some of those allegations that were made back during the Trump initial impeachment and and claims that Biden's efforts and works on Ukraine, while he claimed they were in the pursuit of getting rid of public corruption in Ukraine, that they actually benefited a company that Hunter Biden sat on the board of. Republicans did jump on this and had been leaked to them that this memo existed explaining about these payments. They managed to force the FBI to give it to them. They repeated what they claim the FBI told them, which was this was a trusted confidential human source that had made these allegations. A lot of the press is now saying, oh, look, the Republicans have such egg on their face because Weiss has indicted this guy and he's clearly a liar. I'd certainly agree that it's always wise to treat very carefully things that human sources and the FBI are telling you these days. But I do think this puts attention on the FBI and it's what to me is a a growing string of confidential human informants that seem to have some real problems that the FBI has relied on in the past by their own acknowledgement. Well, as I understand it, the FBI had actually attested to the accuracy of some of the information from this FBI informant. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. And this is why Republicans felt confident bringing this allegation forward because they were initially told they couldn't have this information because this human informant was so important to the FBI and indeed had been such an asset to them that they did not want to risk his outing. And even if his name was redacted from this report, the fear that somehow people would put the pieces together. So that's what Republicans were told. Now the FBI and David Weiss turns around and says, this guy is a snake. And we, we keep hearing more, like not only was his information unreliable, but now they're suggesting he might have ties to Russian intelligence, etc. So I think there's still a lot more to hear about this. All right. Let's turn before we go to the question of military aid to Ukraine. The House and the Senate are out this week. Come back next week where they'll have to deal with the budget issues so so the government doesn't shut down. But then the issue of Ukraine aid is becoming more urgent. And that was made clear in the Munich Security Conference over the weekend where American delegation, which always goes there, heard from the Europeans and from Zelensky as well about the urgent need for Ukraine to get more ammunition to resist Russian advances. J.D. Vance, senator from Ohio, was at the conference, but didn't bother to meet with uh, Zelensky or listen to him, or for that matter, to some of the private European meetings. Asked about it, Vance said he didn't think he would learn anything. So I think uh, you have a man who's running for 
vice president on the Trump ticket by making the case for Trump's opposition to Ukraine aid. Where does this stand, uh, Kate? Is this so we're still in limbo here? We don't know how this is going to play out in the House, do we? We don't. I mean, it is ironic, I think, to go all the way to Munich and not even attend the meetings. If you have such a strong case against USAID, why not take it directly to power? Um, speak true to them. But that's not what happened. We don't have a path forward in the House just yet, but I remain somewhat cautiously optimistic because the underlying votes are there for Ukraine aid. And there are a couple different ways it could go. You had some lawmakers roll out a kind of skinny Ukraine bill that tries to take some of the financial aid for Ukraine out and focus more on weapons and ammunition. And some center right members in the House conference ginned that up, Brian Fitzpatrick from Pennsylvania. And I think when your own members are clamoring for a vote on something, it changes the politics a little bit for Speaker Mike Johnson and just, oh, the Senate bill was sent over to us. So I think that there is a path forward. And again, If he doesn't take up a skinny bill or if he ignores the Senate bill, I think eventually the dam will break on a discharge petition that allows the 218 signatures to move a bill around Johnson's objections. So I don't think it can be avoided for much longer in any case. And so I think that gives Johnson a reason to find a way forward on his own um, before having it decided for him. One of the things I think they have to be concerned about, and we'll end on this point, is the, the Republicans, that is, is if the military aid to Ukraine collapses and there's none going forward. I think it's fair to say that Ukraine is going to have a very difficult time maintaining its position and a rout of its forces or significant retreat can't be ruled out at all. It may even be likely between now and the election. And if that happens, I think there's considerable peril for the Republicans. There'll be a fight over who's to blame, Biden, the Republicans, who lost Ukraine if it comes to that. But I think the Republicans will not be able to escape considerable blame for that. And that's, of course, jeopardizing a longstanding Republican strength, which is, in fact, strength on foreign policy and opposition, at least since the Reagan years, to rogue states on the march. All right. Thank you, Kate. And thank you, Kim. Thank you all for listening. We're here every day on Potomac Watch, and we sure appreciate your listening.